Okay, uh, so it's uh, 5, 5 p.m. in Belgium and 6 uh, p.m. in Bulgaria. So I think it's uh, the time to start uh, this webinar. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here with us today. Um, I'm Charlotte. I work for Libraries Without Borders in Belgium. And I'm here with uh, colleagues from Libraries Without Borders and also colleagues from Education Without Backpacks uh, in Bulgaria. Uh, to introduce uh, this webinar, I'll start with some uh, elements of context. So this webinar is organized uh, in the context of an Erasmus Plus project that was launched in February 2022. So a bit less than a year and a half ago. Uh, and this project is called Can for STEM. Uh, the goal was to work on more effective and inclusive European math and science teaching with the support of the internationalized work of European Can Academy advocates uh, that we are uh, at Libraries Without Border and uh, Education Without Backpacks. Um, so the educative platform Can Academy is at the at the heart of the project, but we discussed uh, digital practices uh, beyond this uh, educative platform, as you will see it uh, during this webinar. Um, so in a few words, we worked uh, with teachers, we organized workshops, we developed a toolkit that uh, we will talk a bit more about later uh, today. Um, we organized training and now uh, today we are uh, holding this uh, final webinar uh, in order to share with you um, uh, what we've been uh, working on uh, for all this time. Um, so today, uh, as you can see, the theme, uh, well, the theme is the power of smart digitalization in school in schools. Uh, we'll give you an overview of the result of our project. Uh, we'll try and share some insights and address the future actions uh, that can be taken. Um, today with, with us, we have uh, Michael Deger, uh, is with us to share his views on education and digital technologies. Um, after this discussion with uh, Mikael, uh, Svetlana uh, will present a successful project uh, with Ken Academy. And then we'll end uh, this time together with Ivan, uh, who will talk about ChatGPT and how a, uh, AI uh, can be integrated in education. So uh, to interact with us today, uh, please use the comments, ask questions, react. Uh, there is, a, uh, you can access the comment section uh, by clicking on the three dots uh, on the lower right corner of your screen. Um, and at the end, we'll uh, have some time to answer some of your questions uh, that my colleague Justine here uh, will present. Um, uh will present uh justine is also our uh, timekeeper today so we'll try not to be longer than 60 minutes as uh, it was planned um okay so we'll start this first uh the first party of this webinar uh with uh michael i don't know if michael is here yes <laughs> hello uh, thank you for uh, being here. Um, I'm just going to introduce you in a few words. Um, so, Michael, you are the director of the computer science department of the Haute Ecole Bruxelles Brabant, so in Belgium. Uh, you are a digital pedagogy specialist, uh, a software developer, an author, a lecturer, and a trainer. Um, Amongst many uh, projects, uh, you have taken part in the development of the new pedagogical reference system uh, called uh, Pacte d'Excellence for the Fédération Wallonie-Bruxelles, which is the French-speaking uh, part uh, of Belgium. So you are wearing wearing uh, many hats, uh, so uh, that make you that allows you to have a look at different levels on the real use and interest of digital tools in addition to pedagogies. So I'm going to start with a very very broad uh, question: uh, How, uh, according to you, how are uh, digital tools relevant in science uh, education, science uh, teaching? 
First of all, hi everyone. Thank you for having me today. It's my first time in English, so my English is not perfect. I prepare my answers, so don't be surprised if I check sometimes my notes. Um, to answer the question, based on my professional experience, there are many ways to design the integration of digital into the teacher skills. According to my personal analysis, I think that the, the most pragmatic approach is to present digital as an additional tool for the teacher. With a well-filled toolbox, I think that the teacher will be able to choose the best way to teach every time, whether with or without digital. It doesn't matter, in fact. What matters is that it chooses the best pedagogy every time in relation to the knowledge and its particular context of work. Um, can give you maybe an example for that. Um, if you we're talking about the organ, which constitutes the, the different parts of the animals. Uh, in the context before 2000, it was not uncommon to dissect an animal in class, to discover the corresponding knowledge and to uh, discover um, uh, how works the, 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 what's inside the animals, uh, and to discover the around other knowledge about other animals. They used a lot of um, diagrams to make transfer. After 2000 and many changes in the mentalities, this section left the school, left school classes. Obviously, I'm not talking about university, only uh, uh, school before. Um, pedagogical tools have been reduced and many teachers have focused on diagrams. Now, 20 years later, we can talk about it freely again, but why? Simply because simulation has appeared in education, helped by digital support. Today, we can dissect in a virtual, clean, and respectful way. Our toolbox is filled up again, um, but it's not just that. It uh, even gets bigger because today we can dissect collectively, if we want, on an interactive whiteboard or individually on a tablet, for example. We can differentiate too and do both at the same time. But even more impressive, we can see and manipulate what is inside a whale, for example, or a dinosaur, because everything is possible with the simulation. I'm not saying that uh, dissection is the perfect teaching tool. I'm just expanding the, the list of possibilities for the teacher. It's up to him every time to make his choice and uh, to choose the best one. So at the end, pedag pedagogically, freedom is for me a challenge to highlight every opportunity for the teacher and for the pupils at the same time. Thank you for this first uh, answer. Um, I think that the example with the um, dinosaur, I think you mentioned, like it's super, like uh, um, yeah, it it, no, sorry, it shows uh, it shows uh, really <laughs> what we can do uh, with uh, technology uh, uh, today. Um, so in in the context of the project, the Erasmus Plus project, project um, we've talked a lot uh, with the teachers about the posture of the teacher, um, but some of aspects uh, that we have perhaps, perhaps uh, less addressed um, is uh, also the, that the world is changing and the, especially children are changing. So uh, in their relationship with, with school uh, and the learning process, uh, what are your, your views uh, on these aspects of the, of the changes? Okay, let's talk about the children or puppies. Um, what are the children dreaming of becoming today? I think that the, the astronaut, for example, has given way to the YouTuber or the teacher to the participation participants of a reality TV show, for example, uh, the firefighter to the sportman and, and, and more. Um, I'm obviously caricaturing a little bit, but they have all changed their dream. But those I told you, they have not all changed their dream, sorry, but I told you about one thing they have all in common, is that the school is not responsible for their success. So the YouTuber is not because, because of, I think not famous because of school, uh, the same for a reality TV show and, uh, and, and the other things. Another thing is, well, before we told uh, to the children that the school is important for your future, uh, you get rich working at school, these are concept. These concepts are um, have disappeared at the same time. Another thing is uh, going to school while mom and dad stay at home, working from home uh, is not far for the children too. And that's not all. Imagine ourselves a pupil. 
my, smart, my smartphone knows more than me. And ChatGPT, for example, more know-how than me too. They talk to me in class about skills, but they give me lessons as before in a transmissive way. Of course, I'm still caricaturing, but what is obvious is that the school must work on skill, like it says. The school must be motivating. The school must ensure itself in the new society. Digital is not always essential, but if, we, if it can, it can help. Its main attraction is motivation. Learning when you are motivated is already not so bad. Uh, in any case, I prefer myself uh, this to learning because you have to learn. I don't know you, but I hope it's the same thing for you. Yes. Uh, yeah. Thank you for for this uh, insight. Uh, it's uh, always interesting. Like it's always super important also to consider both sides. Uh, of course, that's what we did during this project. But our main um, uh, participant were adults, so that was the the more the poster of the teacher we discussed. Um, my next question uh, would be um, about the different uh, levels uh, of uh, implication, I'd say. Uh, so when talking about uh, when talking of digital skills, um, differences in the narrative depends on whether one is interested in European dynamics, national discourses and the reality on the ground of teachers. Um, can you give us an overview, a uh, short overview of the current situation? That's right. <laughs> uh, there are four levels, I think, for of power that can change things in uh, the technology in the screen school. Uh, the largest in size is Europe. With DigiComp proposal, I think that the European Union seems to have everyone aligned. That's okay. Then come the countries. In Belgium, for example, our political system is very complicated. Education is divided into several ministers, and these are not from the same political party, so it's really complex. Enforcing a decision takes time. Example, DISCOM was created in 2010, uh, but the implementation in the French-speaking part of Belgium is, was in 2018, so eight years later. The next level in Belgium is what are called the organizing, organizing power. So maybe it's very easier to understand if, if I say school networks. This divides the school again in different groups managed separately, uh, Catholic, communal, regional, and many more in, in Belgium, for example. So between 2018 and 2023, digital skills had to be adapted uh, for everyone to make courses program in every separation. So now, 13 years later, we finally arrive in the school where we have just lost these years without training anyone. Um, all this obviously is necessary, but it's too slow. It's inside school, I think, that change can really be made and fast, both through the relationship between direction teams and teacher, but also between teacher and purpose of school. So let's not wait. Let's be drivers of change. and. That goes not for only for computer science or for uh, numerical ways, but uh, at the same time for climate, for gender, and many more uh, new new uh, subjects in, the, in our society. Thanks. Uh, well, it's kind of uh, reassuring as well because it means that projects uh, like this one that we have been uh, all, uh, holding and uh, working on for uh, the past eighteen months uh, are are useful, right? <laughs> so that's a good news. Um, so maybe uh, I go um, on uh, the 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 not yeah definition kind of way of digital uh, technology. Um, so as we discussed, it, uh, digital technology is getting a place in teaching practices. Uh, that's for sure. Uh, but we could say it's uh, in two ways. So first, uh, because the Digital mastery is uh, coming into the curriculum uh, in Belgium officially uh, next year. Um, but also, uh, and this is more what we addressed uh, in uh, with this project, Can for STEM, um, digital technology is changing and enriching teachers' pedagogical practices by providing them with a whole series of tools. 
In these two dynamics, uh, which represent a real challenge for uh, teachers, what is the real challenge uh, for teachers and how can we help them uh, get on the digital uh, bandwagon, according okay. to you? <laughs> I think the teachers are caught today in a paradox. So uh, in Belgium, for example, uh, we have too many injection and few real ready to use tools. We know everyone that these are, these are not what we want, but with so much reform, this is what the teachers expect. We, professionals, would like to support them in the development of their practice, but with what, we, with what budget and with what time. The trainers are too few for in Belgium, and the learners do not have time to learn every new thing in the, the program. So all to help them effectively, it's not simple. However, there are two things I use often to motivate them. First one, I say that digital at school is very close to learning a language. It's often reassuring to compare something new to something you know. In this case, developing a mother tongue, it's an analogy that can work. We are born into, we are born into environments where most often language is present. First parallel with digital natives. It's not because we practice it that we master it. Language like, like digital are tools at the service of potentially all other disciplines at the school and the same in the, in the life. Both language and digital must now be taught to go beyond <coughs> uses and understandings within families and to allow their use to develop the rest of the skills with efficiency and simplicity. If we have succeeded in making illiteracy almost disappear, we will be able to reduce, reduce the digital divide, I think. We just have to realize that it's necessary, that's the first thing, and that we are cap capable of it. Uh, thank you uh, of your tools, for example. Secondly, there are three ways to conceive digital in education. And I think that our most all teachers are already champions in certain areas. First way is working with digital. All the data show that teachers use digital uh, almost every day, very regularly, and qualitatively outside the classroom. They prepare courses and educational tools, exchange with colleagues, and also make monitoring tables, for example. The next step is to take is to teach with digital technology. The figures show us that the desire is more and more perceptible, and that what is lacking at the moment is training and, of course, equipment. They are coming, uh, I'm sure. But at this moment, you have to take the lead or wait, or if you are in bed. Finally, uh, teach digital, which means to teach something that has not been learned by yourself. Well, but in reality, what happiness? It is an opportunity to innovate and to show, and to show off the superpowers of teachers. Just take a scroll on Twitter to see the hundreds of great ideas that appear each week. Teaching is not imitating the teaching we have received. It is, as already said, we're thinking daily, what are we going to teach and how we are going to teach it with regard to the context in which we are, of course, located. Thanks. Um, thank you. I really like the comparison between uh, learning a language and uh, learning how to use uh, digital tools. Uh, um, I see that we are almost running out of time for this part. So I'll ask the, the last question. Um, uh, and it was, uh, can you share with us um, a, a promising technology uh, or at least uh, an example uh, of use that you are particularly uh, excited or thrilled uh, about? Of course. Uh, at this time, I'm very interested in uh, everything about simulation. Of course, only if concrete uh, action is impossible. Simulate becomes, in my opinion, almost a new obligatory step in the scientific process. Today, we can design and test almost everything. We can experience uh, uh, the unimaginable. Design a vegetable garden on Mars, for example, simulate resuscitation, plants, plants in, in virtually very climatic condition, etc. If that makes you think that is the tomorrow's world, but you're wrong. We recently worked in a, in a school uh, for future truck drivers. These children between the age of five, five, uh, 15 and 18 
train on private land with a single track. We have installed driving simulators there. Today, they are still doing real training, of course, but they have also multiplied their practice time by six using the simulation. Simulating also means using AI, for example, AI to boost creativity and to attempt the impossible. If you try maybe to write on uh, uh, ChatGPT, for example, hello, AI, what's the first emergency to save our planet? What can students do to help? And can you maybe simulate the effect if every children of our, our school apply your recommendation? You can be surprised, you can, you can have good surprise and good possibilities to do things, new things with your pupils in classroom. Thank you. Uh, all of this was super interesting, really. Thank you very much, uh, Michael, for um, being with here uh, with us <laughs> uh, today. Um, so as a very, very quick uh, conclusion, I'd say that uh, the, we need local uh, initiatives. Uh, things are move, uh, yes, are moving uh, at a European level and national level, but at very uh, different uh, uh, path. And uh, yeah, initiatives as also um, to come from uh, teachers and uh, schools, uh, etc. Um, and yeah, digital skills are part of the the future. So if we think of it as a language, uh, we need uh, if we learn uh, French, uh, we need to learn French before learning mathematics into French. So that's also the idea we can have with digital tools. So thank you very much again. Uh, and I'll um, give the floor to uh, Svetlana, uh, who's going to talk uh, about um, a learn storm and a, a successful uh, activity with uh, Khan Academy. Hello, everybody. I hope you can see and hear me quite well. Just give me a sign that you that you can hear me and you can see me. Okay, thank you so much. So yeah, um, let me introduce myself. Firstly, my name is Svetlana Goranova, and uh, for a long time, my passion has been mathematics. Uh, as a co-founder of the Educational Initiative Fund Mathematics based in Bulgaria, and now as an educational expert uh, in one of the two host organizations that is organizing this uh, event, uh, namely Education Without Backpacks. So uh, my role today is to present you uh, one very successful educational digital activity, which is engaging, absolutely free, effective, and fun. The activity is based on the online platform Khan Academy. And now I want to ask you, have you heard about Khan Academy? Maybe for lots of people, this would be a silly question, uh, but let me say a few words about it. So now I will start also presenting uh, something here, just Svetlana, mute, your, mute yourself. You are muted. Okay. Just a moment again. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So. Khan Academy is not just a regular site. It is a platform. The mission of Khan is to provide a free world class education for anyone everywhere. It is a personalized learning resource for all ages. What it offers? It offers practice exercises, articles, instructional videos, and a personalized learning dashboard that empowers learners to study at their own pace in and outside of the classroom. So, uh, what can you learn through Khan Academy? Actually, uh, you can study math, science, computing, history, art history, lots of lots of things. And, you know, it's been translated into 36 languages. Um, 
which means that uh, you can check uh, you can check uh, the platform in your country by here just changing the prefix i'll show you for example for the bulgarian version you just put vg and um i hope you can follow yeah so now it's in bulgarian now and um yeah for example you can you can check a lot of resources so here here are the yeah bulgarian versions but um as I said, you can check for mathematics, uh, science, uh, even financials, even uh, health and medicine. So a lot of, a lot of materials. And now I'll show you, yeah, that's one, one thing which is really also important is that the platform is based on the system for full comprehension of the necessary skills, the so-called mastery learning. So for example, I choose a class here in my teacher's dashboard. And you can see here on the left-hand side, it's course mastery. So uh, just a few words about this, this uh, teacher's, teacher, teacher's dashboard. So once you register as a teacher, uh, you have your, uh, so this is how it looks, the dashboard, and you have your classes here on the left-hand side. You can add a new class here. You can see your students. Yeah, and the mo most importantly, actually, you can assign tasks for the, for, for the class. Um, so if you, if you want to see more information, you can check here in the Help Center. As I said, it is absolutely free, and you can also you can also reach it in in, in your language. Um, so now I would like to turn to the activity, which I mentioned uh, is the the goal of my presentation now. Uh, so. Um, the Sofia Science Festival is a favorite event every year, which happens to bring educators, students, parents in one place. Uh, this year, we organized a workshop on Khan Academy and LearnStorm. I'm going to show you sh shortly what is LearnStorm for several classes of third and fourth grade. So what do you need for this activity? For this activity, you need mobile devices for every student or a computer for every student and a computer with a projector for the teacher. And then you divide the class into two groups. Here, I made two groups, koalas and pandas. So I split it, my class into two groups. Now, this is just an example class, which I did, just to show you how it works. So I make here add a new class. Yeah, and then uh, this is what happened, is that I created these two classes. So let me see the koala class. When I press the Koala class, what I see is now here I see the assignment scores, uh, but I can check, for example, my students. This is the list of my students. And what I use mostly is the scores, where I see the scores of my students assign button. So in the assign button, I can assign any exercise I want to assign. So what I did in this challenge during the Sofia Science Festival is that we divided the group, the class into two groups, koalas and pandas, and we gave them a 30 minutes challenge, which means that we uh, assigned different exercises to the class. For example, I may, I may choose this one uh, or well, this is a whole unit, so this is a lot of work. So you see there's 29 tasks here, which would <laughs> definitely uh, be solved for much more than 30 minutes. But let's say, for example, you assign five or six exercises. Um, and then the class is dealing with these exercises. And while they're dealing with these exercises, you can go to scores and you can see how each 
of the students is doing. And this is what it shows, 80%. So it means they might have made one mistake or well, it could be even less, of course. And 100%, it, it means it's absolutely right. So what happens after that is that uh, when the 30 minutes is over, I say, okay, students, now is the time to see whose team made better. And now the, the tool called LearnStorm comes on stage. What does it show? You know, you, you see this uh, visualization of rings. Actually, every ring, every ring represents a certain amount of skills obtained while solving the tasks. And what is in more, more, more important here is that Khan Academy is based on skills, on obtaining skills and to a mastery level. So this is why we call this mastery challenge because uh, the idea of the mastery challenge is to fully master the material before moving on, periodically reviewing skills already learned and catching up on gaps. So when I press check for progress, I will see that the ring start appearing, start appearing, which creates a bit of excitement, tension, and they become very impatient to see where the rings will stop, in which ring will have, will stop. So, um, yeah, now I would like uh, to ask my colleague to uh, to show a video, which will actually uh, show you the result of such a uh, tool of the LearnStorm. Uh, there will be different videos from different settings, different classes where children uh, just, uh, just wait for the result after they have completed their tasks. And you will see the joy and inspiration uh, which they have um from the task and now before that i want to show you here check for progress and this is actually what we do in the two groups simultaneously seeing which which group has achieved more so my children have already worked and i want to check the progress for this group let me see check for progress and you see how the rings are appearing one by one and of course, this is shown in a big screen in front of the whole class. Everybody is seeing that. Everybody is seeing how their own efforts actually contributes to the results of the whole group, of the whole class. And so this is why it's collaborative. Wow. OK, we have the one ring. And let's, let's just check if there is another ring here. Yeah, as I said, every effort of a single kid, of a single student contributes to the whole group to the process of the whole group that is why it is very engaging for the whole class and you see that this is could be also a very motivational tool to study more and more okay so i think now we have much not not much left here and after that, we'll show you a video of the reaction of the children. Okay. Okay. So I think I believe this this could this could continue a long time. So I'll I'll stop now and ask my colleague uh, to to show you the uh, the video. Okay, you ready to check our progress? Yeah! All right, here we go. <laughs>
Okay, thank you so much for this video. Uh, well, the team uh, that won the Morse course got a prize in the end, uh, but the other team also got something. So they were all very happy. But most importantly, the teacher shared that uh, she could assign tasks her, to her students during the summer uh, so that kids can improve their skills. So as I said, it's absolutely free. It's easy to use, and there are a lot of materials that could be assigned. So I hope that this short presentation uh, gives you a glimpse of what is possible to happen in your classroom. And now um, I would like to say that Khan Academy is not now even more personalized with the uh, artificial intelligence feature, um, which is called Khan Migo. Um, it is not surprising that the artificial intelligence goes more into education. Uh, so my dear colleague uh, Ivan Gospodinov uh, will share with you the most important novelties in the sphere of artificial intelligence, namely the platform ChatGPT. Um, is it true, Ivan? Is it true, Ivan, that uh, we can write poems or summarize books using the ChatGPT? Maybe most of you know about it, but what is it that we might still don't know? Ivan, share, please, with us. Well, I, I think there are a lot of things that are still unknown. I, I really hope that um, the next school year will be uh, will be more informed as to what we can do with uh, AI and artificial intelligence. Um, but for instance, what's interesting about Canmigo, the um, chatbot that Can Academy uh, tries to develop, is that it will mostly ask questions to the students. So um, in a bit, we'll show you a video of uh, how you can use chatbots, uh, particularly ChatGPT, um, as teachers. Uh, we decided to do it uh, in a video because of not to risk any internet connection or uh, to, to make it a bit faster and a bit more um, uh, compact. But um, still, I think that there will be a lot of new educational um, functions developed with uh, chatbots. There are other platforms, educational, which also add chatbots. Uh, for instance, imagine um, entering uh, an educational platform, um, making a test of some sort or, or formulating questions for your students, uh, and then just clicking uh, on a button that says, um, give me a suggestion or something like that, or, or edit my uh, question so that it sounds more simple uh, to kids, etc., etc. So, So there's a lot of ways to, um, let's say, manipulate the uh, the chatbots so that they give you interesting material uh, with which uh, you can work with your children uh, and uh, students uh, on on variety of topics. Um, so I've, I've covered much of this in the following video. Um, I think we should just play it now and don't waste much more time. So now I want to show you how you can use ChatGPT as teachers in order to create different types of learning material, um, learning activities, etc. Actually, you can make a lot of things with ChatGPT. Um, if you're still not familiar with it, so make sure to register and try it out. Uh, this is the free version that I'm going to show you and it works completely fine. Um, and uh, keep in mind that your, your students probably already know about it and use it. Uh, so for the next school year, it will be really good to um, figure out how in your classroom uh, at, at such an instrument can be used in a constructive way. So let's start now with a 50-minute lesson for the Pythagorean theorem. Um, you can add a really detailed uh, question or um, request for, for the chat GPT. As, as much as um, more detail you give it, um, it, it gives better answers. Uh, but still, I will go with something um, somewhat general. So now it will write uh, this 50 minute lesson and how would it do it? Well, keep in mind that it um, has access to all kinds of internet uh, content. So basically you can think about ChatGPT and other such uh, chatbots as a new way to browse the internet or a new way to search uh, through the internet. Uh, what this basically means is that ChatGPT um, actually, most people call it a language model, uh, artificial intelligence, which means that it basically combines words really well. 
So if you are wondering if it will give you a good uh, answer to what you ask um, ChatGPT, um, think about if there are enough uh, texts on the internet that will uh, actually be helpful for the chatbot to make sense of what uh, you're asking it to do. Now I want to show you how you can expand this uh, lesson plan to, to get more resources that might be useful. So for instance, gather the students for a class discussion to summarize the key points uh, covered in the lesson. Let's see now, uh, I will ask ChatGPT to give me um, talking points for the following activity. So, uh, meaning that any kind of discussions you want to have you with your students, uh, you can ask ChatGPT to give you um, a list of questions that might uh, be useful for this uh, discussion. So let's see, uh, it's quite detailed, so I will not be able to go through it, but basically it gives us um, hints as to what kind of aspects of uh, the Pythagorean theorem we can ask students about. Now, I decided to um, pick the Pythagorean theorem because I've often heard uh, the sentence, well, why do students learn the Pythagorean theorem? Why do we study this at all, etc., etc.? Why, why would we use it and, and when will we use it in, in life? So, a good way to um, use ChatGPT is to ask it, so let's see, uh, give me examples of real life uses of the theorem, um, make them interesting for students, let's say. So, uh, basically it will give us um, insight into how some careers might use the Pythagorean theorem or how uh, in some technologies the theorem is used. Uh, but again, it's, uh, it's something that uh, is often a hard question in the classroom. Uh, why are we learning a particular concept? So ChatGPT can make these conversations uh, a bit more structured and a bit more easier for us teachers as well. I am myself not uh, always sure how to answer this question to my students, uh, but ChatGPT could nevertheless help us. Now, let's say that you want to make it a bit more interesting or more uh, narrative-like. Let's say, um, how would Pythagoras explain the importance of his theorem to children? Let's see now. Um, you can also ask ChatGPT to make conversations between different scientists or historical figures. Um, as long as you give it um, the, the, a good amount of detail, uh, it could make the, uh, the conversations interesting. What I mean here is that if you, for instance, want to compare two scientists, it would be good to add to the, to the prompt or to the request um, which topic they should discuss or uh, should they argue about it or should they um, have a, a normal um, conversation about it without any hard arguments or etc etc so you can make um, all kinds of scripts let's say um, even if you want to have a let's say a three minute lecture uh, in front of your students with something interesting about the, the theorem or any other topic uh, you could also ask the the chatbot to write a short uh, speech, so to speak. Now, of course, we can also use it for more uh, simple requests, such as, let's see, make a test with multiple choices um, for the theorem. And of course, I mean, if you want open uh, questions, it will give you open questions, etc., etc. Uh, you see how it goes. It basically, again, combines words and ideas really well as long as it has enough databases from the internet from which it can draw um, its conclusions and its results. Let's see now. Um, by the way, keep in mind that if you want a really long test, you can also ask to write 20 questions, 50 questions, 100 questions, 
uh, it doesn't really matter. Uh, sometimes it might stop at some point. Uh, keep in mind that this is probably because um, a lot of people are using it right now. Uh, as you so, if you just ask the uh, the chatbot to continue, it will try to make sense what you mean and it will continue. Uh, let's see what we will write now. Okay, more tests. Um, but the point was that if it stops at, uh, at some sentence, uh, you can make it finish the sentence or the whole paragraph, etc, etc. Um, another thing you should know is that you can ask ChatGPT to edit some of those texts. Let's say you, you might ask it to um, use simple terms. Uh, or you can ask him to use more complex terms um, to write it as if for kindergarten ch children or for professors, etc., etc. So um, you can make it write all kinds of text or at least try to write all kinds of text. Uh, keep in mind that, of course, sometimes if you, um, let's say, want two complex or two specific things from the chatbot, it can sound really... Um, uh, what's the word persuasive uh, really um, authoritative about not quite true thing some people also call this hallucinating when the chatbot just talks uh, nonsense um, for instance uh, sometimes if you ask it to um, tell you more about what's written in a book it could end up um, just creating new chapters of the book and creating a new storyline just to sound uh, authoritative enough. Um, okay, uh, I hope that uh, this was interesting for you. Of course, you could imagine how many other uses it has. Again, it could create games, it can create uh, steps that students need to take in order to make a project, a scientific project. If you ask it to make you scientific projects, it will also give you a lot of ideas. Um, I hope you, you enjoyed that. I hope that you try it out really the best way to um, to learn how to use ChatGPT just to play with it, um, just to ask it if you wish uh, meaningless questions um, and, and you will um, get how it works. It really takes some time. Um, keep in mind that, again, all kinds of internet content that is uh, that can be found in large databases uh, is resource for the for the chatbot, meaning that it can create also um, theater plays, um, it can create songs, uh, poetry, uh, movie scripts, etc, etc. Uh, whatever is in written text, of course, there are other AIs which work with images, videos, etc. Um, to be honest, next school year will probably be a bit more exciting and a bit more stressing as well. But still, um, it's, it's not something that we can just banned from schools in the sense that this really is a new way to search the internet and it's up to us as teachers and um, our students of course should participate in this to figure out how to use this in a really meaningful way so that we learn with it and we don't just use it to avoid learning thank you Well, uh, I really hope that this was interesting for you. Um, I, I, I think at the end, I will try to, to uh, say uh, some more words about AI and education. So I will give now the word back to Svetlana. Uh, thank you, Ivan. It was really interesting for me, although I've seen all these things, but uh, always I learned something new from you. So thank you so much. Yeah, and now um, I would like to give the word to our time and question smiley person, Justine. And that is it's me, you. yes. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, I would like to encourage anyone in the public to put in their questions or remarks in the chat. Feel free to voice it out. And if we don't have time to answer your questions, of course, we can uh, work on a way to to provide you with some extra elements uh, after the after the conference. Um, actually, I saw a comment a few a few minutes ago mentioning how uh, tools like ChatGPT uh, seem kind of uh, exciting to a lot of students and uh, and potentially to also a few teachers already. 
But there are also some teachers that feel like uh, these tools are really part of the future and so remote from the reality of today. Um, I think one of the highlights in the Canva STEM project, like a really key element was the idea that teachers can help one another in this dynamic. And so I guess one question could be uh, how, um, as a teacher who is excited about these technologies, uh, how can I help uh, my fellow teachers? How to create an effect of community and to better share those solutions? If anyone wants to jump in, the floor is yours. <laughs> well, if we are talking about AI and, uh, and chat GPT, um, it can actually answer this question in a sense. Uh, it can... Uh, provide ideas for how to structure uh, a conversation or a, or a group discussion with other teachers. Uh, it can actually help you also write uh, a first email uh, invitation for, for other teachers. Um, so that would be one thing. And I, I really think that telling other colleagues about what you have done with a particular instrument and actually showing them is probably the best thing to do. So. You just really need a laptop, you open chat GPT, and if, if someone hasn't seen it yet, then they will surely be amazed. And uh, again, uh, our students know about chat GPT and use it, so we also need, need to uh, get on track. Okay, so probably lead by example and with concrete, ex yeah, concrete cases, concrete examples on how to, how to use it in the classroom. Um, I see a question uh, that is about uh, the potential ways of checking if student work was created in ChatGPT. I think it's a big, big question that's getting asked around right now. Um, as an uh, uh, to kind of prolong on the on on this question, um, one thing could be also like so. Basically, how do you encourage your students to use tools like this one, not just as a way to uh, get massive amounts of information and just copy them into their work, but really use it in a creative kind of way. Um, yeah, well, um, I think that there is a specific way to um, make instructions so that students have to do a task with ChatGPT. Um, let me think of an example. So, well, for instance, if students are working on a scientific project, um, it really will be helpful to ask the chatbot to give them some steps and some um, things to um, do one after the other. So it's not all about the it's it's not so much about the creative thing, but more about how to organize and structure your project because this is also important in order to to have meaningful results. Um, so. Um, another um, um, another uh, way to use it would be to try and analyze and criticize the the results of ChatGPT or cha or trying to uh, say something more or say something more precisely. So, for instance, it's if if you ask ChatGPT to uh, solve a math problem, I'm I'm not sure how uh, much uh, this has been. Um, dealt with by now but um a year ago it was really bad at solving math problems uh so this made it easy for uh, teachers in physics and in math to use it in order for for their students to try and figure out what's the error uh, and what should be corrected so there is also a way to use it uh, in order to criticize it or say something more about a subject than the the chatbot would now how do we know if a student has used uh, a chatbot? Well, it's really hard to know. Um, for one thing, um, a bit of intuition helps. So the chatbot really gives the most general and balanced uh, answer there could be, uh, even to the point of missing some details and specifics about, let's say, a particular um, a philosopher, or a writer, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so it would be easy to spot if a student's work sounds like a Wikipedia article. Um, that's one thing. Um, a second option would be to ask ChatGPT if it wrote this text. 
Now, sometimes it says yes, sometimes it says it, it looks like as if it has been written by a chat bot, uh, but I still don't trust it. Now, some of my students, they have told me that they have used the, the chat bot to enhance their writing so that to edit them, let's say, or add something to them with the help of the chat bot. And, and this is hard to, to spot. And another thing is that even when those, um, let's say, there are also websites that claim that they can spot a chat GPT text, but they're also not that, um, um, that good at it. Um, but even if if the, such websites uh, um, begin to catch chat GPT text, then students still can use chat GPT to uh, manipulate those texts even more. As I said in the in the clip, uh, you could ask ChatGPT to write a particular sentence in better English language, in worse English language, with grammatical uh, errors. Uh, it could, if you put effort into it, you can really make it um, um, not in any sense different that than a, a student would would uh, would write it. So in this sense, I think that the, the best bet so far is to try and figure out what kind of tasks and instructions can be done with using ChatGPT and not trying to avoid it. Just putting students in the in the position to have to figure out how to learn with ChatGPT and not how to avoid learning with it. Thank you so, so much. I see a lot of comments and a lot of questions in this chat section. I've seen one or two about the use of AI on Khan Academy. I will actually uh, post a little uh, link towards a video uh, developing a little bit more on that specific topic in the chat section in a few seconds. But I am now giving the mic back so that we can have a little conclusion for this conference. Uh, the time has fl flown, flied, uh, the time flew. Yes, <laughs> time flew fast, uh, so uh, we hope you were inspired, but uh, for our conclusive words, uh, I'll let uh, Charlotte and Ivan maybe uh, take the floor. Yeah, thank you, uh, Justine. Um, Ivan, I'll just say a quick word uh, regarding the ambas ambassadors uh, and the toolkit. Um, so as you may have understood, this project uh, was aimed at creating a kind of, um, uh, I'm not going to say a safe space, but at least a space where teachers can feel at ease and find information uh, thanks to a toolkit, uh, but also thanks to a network. So the idea was to create really a network of teachers uh, between Belgium and Bulgaria, but also outside of those two countries uh, in Europe. Um, so to do so, uh, we really encourage you to uh, uh, have a look at our toolkit that you will receive uh, as a follow-up uh, to this webinar. Uh, the toolkit is available in English, in French, and in Bulgarian. Um, and you'll find uh, a lot of uh, like our contact if you want to contact us uh, at uh, Libraries Without Borders or uh, at uh, Education Without Backpack. Um, and that's for the practical info. And I uh, let uh, Ivan have the final word of this uh, super interesting uh, moment we just shared. Well, thank you very much. Um, what I wanted to address at the end is again related to AI um, and more or less the question, well, are is it possible that teachers get substituted by an AI? Is it possible that at some point chatbots will be more useful to students than uh, actual conversations with teachers? Uh, and and there are a lot a, a couple of very drastic differences between what AI can do and what a teacher is. Um, and the first thing is for for instance. Um, the teacher is, after all, an example, uh, a, a living being, a person with biography, history, um, as someone who has ideas, uh, dreams, who had experiences of all sorts. So um, a student, uh, it, I mean, all students will still be incapable of dreaming that they one day 
speak like uh, or think like a chatbot. They really need a human example of how to live this life and, and why do a particular academic terms make sense and why should we learn this and that. Um, so the first thing is AI would never be an example as, as far as what uh, a human can be or should be. Um, the second thing is AI um, wouldn't take any risks or wouldn't really make any life choices um, in, instead of us. So uh, at the end of the day, whatever someone searches for in a, in a chatbot, the decision what to do next will be uh, their own personal decision. Um, and this is something that we, we need to tell students because um, for them, growing up with such a tool uh, begs the question, well, why should I write any text when this tool can can do it for me? Why should I write even poetry when this can when this tool can do it for me? Um, but there is there are a lot a lot of reasons why. Um, and it's said broadly, um, it's it's because we are human. It's because this is what we experience. The chatbot does not experience this. It doesn't make him happy or something like that. So it doesn't really matter. Um, but what really matters is that our students would um, nevertheless need to um, be more and do more than a chatbot because on the on the working space or on the working place um, the question why shouldn't I use a chatbot or instead of hiring someone to do a similar task will be a, a very common question uh, in the next years so we need to uh, inspire and encourage our students to actually try to be more creative than what the chatbot can give as a result to try and always think about what more can be uh, done or said or claimed or or um written in in beautiful words etc etc um and um I, I really think that a lot of students would be um finding hard to motivate themselves to actually try and compete with uh, this uh, very intelligent device. Um, but still, it's it's our job to figure out how to how to actually end up with a better educational system and not uh, in a crisis of some sort. Well, um, I thank guess you. yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> So thank you, everyone, I guess, <laughs> and see you soon. Thank you, everyone, for uh, yeah taking part. Um, it will it will be available in replay in case you want to check some uh, information um, later. later. Um, or yes, send it to you. someone, of course. Yeah, yes, <laughs> yes. Rewatch or uh, share. Um, thank you and good evening to everyone from Bulgaria to Belgium. Bye. Bye-bye. 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 Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.